Good morning. Okay, going to do something a little bit different today because I uh, haven't been out on the water for a while, haven't been anywhere near the boats for a little while, and um, I'm still getting on with everyday life and doing things which, uh, you know, are required in my uh, existence to keep my family going everything. But always I have the same thoughts in the back of my head as I do when I'm out in the middle of the ocean, uh, looking at the stars and wondering how ancient peoples did the exact same thing that I'm doing, crossing great oceans. That has always led me on to a great interest in the Egyptians and ancient civilizations. And because a lot of the stuff I do on the boats is very, um, you have to think in the moment, you've got to solve problems in the moment, you've got to innovate in, in, in whatever is possible. You know, you're a thousand miles offshore, you've got this set of tools, you've got this set of spares and whatever is on the boat, and you've got to fix a problem, otherwise all the lights go out. You get very inventive. And because that's such an everyday part of my life, I often think about early man and how we managed to solve the problems. How do we come up with bread? How do we come up with, um, you know, clay pots? How do we come up with the axle and the wheel? How, somebody at some point had an innovation. And I, I have a kind of like a, a split idea about archaeology and history. On the one side, the work that most archaeologists are doing is absolutely fantastic. You know, they are passionate, they are um, diligent, they are trying to express facts from the past. But the overarching narrative, the over no, that's a terrible word, so loaded these days. The overarching reality is that they don't know what happened because they're guessing from bits that are left over, right? They're incredible history detectives. But at the end of the day, it's a theory about things. Because I have my personal experience of problem solving, I often think about how people who are archaeologists perceive how quickly people can innovate. If we've had the same brain pan and physical skeleton uh, and structure for at least 300,000 years, then we're looking at the fact that like we did nothing with it for a very long time. Now, I know that this is discussed in so many other areas, but when you get down to the nitty gritty, like solving a problem, I have more inventory. I have more kind of like uh, concepts perhaps, but in terms of like inspiration and, and, and coming up with an idea, Children come up with brilliant ideas. People who have no idea about a sport or a science or anything come up with revolutionary concepts because it is possible for things just to be plucked down out of the ether. That question, plucking things down out of the ether, comes down and meets the road. <laughs> that rubber meets this road. When you're in a situation like this, now, we have quite a practical existence here in Nova Scotia. Uh, we have to maintain all these woods. Uh, we've got up there a shed of boating equipment for... 80 foot boats that I sail, we're renovating the house. Uh, you know, I'm a reasonably like practical, competent person, maybe even a bit more than average on the problem solving front. So this looks like ridiculousness, but what's going on here is that this old cart was bequeathed to us, sorry, this old cart was bequeathed to us. We've seen these before, but it hadn't got one wheel, okay? There's no wheel on this side, it's an axle. So this has been lying around in the yard for ages. I'm like, shall I throw away, shall I not? And the other thing that's been going on is that inside this sail bag, of course, the incident sail bag, is a wood-burning stove. Can we see in there? This is not complicated things to understand, okay? The stove weighs about 400 pounds, about 200-ish kilos, something like that, right? The cart only has one wheel. Why am I trying to use the cart to move this this thing, this stove, because my problem solving ability says that the mechanical advantage of that one wheel, however ungainly it is and however difficult it's going to be to get on the other corner and like raunge all this into the air and move it to my new desired position back there. This stove is like slowly exiting the house. Um, the mechanical advantage available from that one wheel is still a better problem solving solution than trying to carry or move the stove end over end. And that got me thinking, like that little kind of like tink, realization, like, yeah, actually, even this, crappy though it is, is better than trying to heave the stove along. That's how people moved from dragging uh, sticks behind them with a load on to like, hey, we're going to put this load on something. Somebody saw their sled rolling on a rolling on a stone or stones or something, and then they're like, huh, can we like put something between the road and the the sled, like people innovated in a really basic way. Now, where's all this going? One of the things that has always interested me in all of the research I've personally done about the Egyptians and ancient civilizations is them moving very heavy rocks. 
I often think about this when I'm out at sea, which is kind of where we come into this today, is that I'm out at sea thinking like, how the hell did people move the huge loads that I'm regularly dealing with on these boats, these big racing boats when we're grinding on one of those winches. That's thousands of kilos of uh, force being transmitted, uh, mechanically driven through the winches, um, all set up to be as perfectly ergonomic as possible to transmit as much power as we can into you know, a rope that's pulling on a sail or is pulling on a, a, a sheet or a spinnaker guy or whatever it is, like huge forces. We have got very, very good at channeling our bodily energy into um, hard tasks. It's one of those things that humans have got very good at, whether it is taking things to huge levels of precision or moving enormous weights. The enormous weights thing is something I kind of have a bit of an idea about. I've done a lot of projects, obviously, with rigging on boats and sailing on boats. And when I talk about project, you know, in your lifetime, you might have a situation where you're like, okay, today, one of the things we're going to do is connect this rope to this thing and develop thousands of kilos of pressure and move this heavy thing. On board a boat, you're doing that, you know, every watch when you're moving the boom around or if you're uh, putting up a spinnaker, there's like 500 horsepower coming through the, the spinnaker. So ropes and moving things and focusing pressure into big tasks, I don't know anything about precision tasks, but big tasks like rocks, I should have a pretty bloody good idea how to get this rock upright. We have this piece of land here, we're in Nova Scotia, we're very lucky to have this uh, space available. Um, a small house, but more land. And we cut lots of paths in, like this one here, um, into what was just a inaccessible kind of wood. And uh, we've created pathways and our little boy loves to run up and down these, as you can imagine. It's great for the health of the family and uh, it's lovely to be able to spend time in nature. This rock we call Sleeping Rock, because the little boy, of course, has to have a, a name for each thing that we go past. Well, my idea here when I cut this path is, because I'm always thinking about bloody <laughs> Egyptians and ancient civilizations moving heavy loads, which is something I have to problem solve and think about from a mechanical advantage position all the time with the same brain pan and mechanics as someone 300,000 years ago with the same possibility of inspiration that they had, but then with loads of modern techniques built on top of that, surely I can get this rock upright. There's kind of like a bit of, bit of maybe a foundation here in that there's a flat area it could go up on. My partner, Kat, who's also a brilliant rigger, but more like in circus and, and entertainment, she was talking about taking this uh, pinched off end here and then putting plugging this into the ground, which is kind of an interesting idea, probably a lot more stable, but then that shape would look best if it was upright. So I think what I'm trying to say is, I want to do a little project here where I'm someone who's obviously inspired by things in nature, makes me think. I have a good understanding of how rigging systems work and applying great force to ropes. Why don't we do a little project where we try and lift this stone upright? Because then we'll have something to talk about on watch at night in the middle of nowhere and go, hey, you know these big loads on these lines? Because there's not many people, unless you operate a crane or overhead lifting equipment or you're a fisherman or you know, industries that involve winches and ropes and big force. Most everyday people are not doing this kind of stuff clearly now or working with the kind of machinery that'd be required to do this now what's interesting with this whole area which is where i drift into the kind of randall carlson uh graham hancocky space but like maybe not quite jimmy corsetti but definitely the uncharted x stuff about precision and science and where i come into this is that you can spend an entire lifetime focusing huge amounts of your physical abilities and concentration and learning into creating precision but in the end there is an upper limit to that and it's interesting then when we're just getting the machinery now to be able to understand that range that is beyond the human limit of, you know, awareness and, and, and creation, we start to find that there are things in ancient history which are operating at that kind of tolerance. And we, we think that they did it with rocks on the wall. It's like, same thing with this, with, you know, this is a task which I'm sure is, I think the only rule with any of this has to be extraordinarily safe as I have a little one running around here as well. So how are we going to do this? It has to be, but that's a good thing, right? Keep the slave armies uh, safe means you have more of them. These are projects that went over like 20 years, a hundred years. How on earth do you manage the political situation to be able to hold that many people in the palm of your finger to do that kind of work for so long? 
And how do you organize it logistically? How do you keep records of what's going on? How do you plan a pyramid? You might have all sorts of clever ideas about, oh, I want to put the stone upright. Okay, fine. It's got like 20 steps and we'll get it done somehow. We might have to innovate. But if it's a pyramid, it's like, you're going to have to create the instruments with which you're going to measure things. Even if you say, hey, look, they did it, which I'm completely down with that. I don't think there's any forces outside of humans that have made this happen. But they were involved in a process which is far deeper than saying, oh, well, they soared through the rock with a copper blade with with carborundum sand, which is believable. How did you keep the people employed to get to the skill set? One thing that you should be aware of, anybody that's in this discussion, a lot of people that are in this discussion, like myself, I'm 47 now, my eyes are starting to go. So if uh, I don't have the ability to have corrective lenses, like at the moment, I'd squint and I'd be able to see the numbers counting on the, the phone in front of me, right? That's where my eyes are at. I can get them lasered now. I can have one made long range and one range short range. And then that's a great way to go through the rest of your adulthood, uh, still being able to see. But if I don't have corrected lenses, and we're living a couple of thousand years ago, we're inside a tomb or inside the Serapium or something, and we're being asked to do incredible levels of precision, you would need to have decades of experience to be able to do that. But also your body would be wearing out because you're a slave and you have no access to healthcare or anything like that. And your eyes are starting to go just at the point where you might be the one that can get that edge that perfect. Like there are... There are leadership logistical things here. There are physical things like there's an upper limit to how much force you can apply to this rock. In the end, if this was made of like, if this was a much bigger rock, let's imagine, if it's like a thousand tons, how do you connect the ropes to it? I have a more than basic understanding of rope technology. And I say it'd be very bloody difficult to move, you know, a 50, 60 ton rock that's got any kind of edges like that with old sizal hemp kind of based ropes. So here's the project. We're going to try and stand that rock up and we're going to have a discussion about uh, ancient um, civilizations and their technology and problem solving and the glaring fact that all the abilities we have today, all the inspirations we have today, all the knowledge we have today, we still can't do things which we're attributing to people in the past regardless of any technology they may or may not have had. So let's have that discussion. Let's try and stand a stone up. And I look forward to looking in the comments because I think this is an area where Lots of generalists coming together with lots of information can suddenly pluck out bits of info. They supposedly, the Egyptians had the wheel, but the stuff that they had in their civilization was built before the period where they had the wheel. But you would need the wheel to be able to move any of this stuff around. And wheels are pulleys, so they did all of this without pulleys. We need to talk. Okay, if you enjoy the conversation, stick something down below. If you like this kind of content, like and subscribe. And we're back to sailing in the next video. And then at least I've got something to chat about when I'm not on the boat, when I'm not doing things. And we can uh, get on with the project at the same time. Cheers.